Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Martina Garcia, and I'm the new CEO of uh, the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. And uh, today is my first event in that position, and I'm absolutely delighted that it's on sustainable finance and with uh, such a distinguished panel. So many of you who follow us uh, already know very well uh, Ben Caldecott. He has many impressive titles. Um, uh, but I think that what is very clear is that you're the undisputed lead expert in sustainable finance in the UK. And then you have been at the forefront of leading many of the public policy developments and, uh, and the research. And we are very, very grateful for your input into a mostly sustainable finance review. We also have the honor of having uh, Mike Penrose, founder of the Sustainable House. And uh, Mike, you will also, I think uh, it will be great that you introduce yourself uh, and, uh, and explain what the Sustainable House is doing and your previous career and what you really want to do with this. And then we also have uh, Rowan Douglas, who, um, is, uh, the, who is leading for um, uh, Willis Tower what's on the Climate and Resilience Hub and is chairing the Willis Research Network. And that looks like a, quite a demanding job, but he still has time to lead many other initiatives and is co-chairing with uh, Ben, the uh, Global uh, Resilience Index Initiative that was uh, launched at Glasgow. So I'm going to ask uh, Mike first to start uh, um, uh, to introduce himself and uh, uh, raise the issues that he thinks are of, uh, at the forefront of his mind at the moment. Mike. And, and an absolute pleasure to be invited. Thank you so much for having me along. Um, as you said, as introduced, I, I co-founded a, a company called the Sustainability Group about two years ago. Um, but prior to that, I was the chief executive of UNICEF here in the UK. I was the chief executive of Action Contre la Fin, Action Against Hunger, which is one of France's largest not-for-profits, and had a, a big background in both humanitarian aid and social development, including uh, being having the privilege of working alongside the SDSN, Jeffrey Sachs's team that uh, helped define the underpinning indicators that, that, that make up the sustainable development goals. And in addition to that, for, for a number of years, I was on the advisory committee of the FTSE for Good. Um, but one of the main projects that I'm working on at the moment with my business partner, Alexandra, is um, we are coming up with a, a product called Future Plus. Our challenge, the thing we're really trying to tackle, is the quantification of intentionality within sustainability. One of the biggest challenges we think we face at the moment is transition risk, is how the finance industry, but also organizations can understand where they want to be in terms of sustainability over the same investment period in which they're expected to report their projections and their profits. Because an awful lot of organizations are afraid to take that first step because they don't know, they, they're afraid of being judged as to where they are right now. And we also feel the pressure from a lot of investors and finance groups that we work with that they feel they have to divest valuable assets that could become more sustainable because they don't have a way of quantifying that and proving that. So when it comes to having a resilient organization that is able to predict in the future how sustainable it could be, we're coming up with a way of quantifying, we have come up with a way of quantifying that, measuring it and reporting it to markets through our product Future Plus. And this is one of the things that I think will be the biggest challenge in organizations demonstrating their sustainability in the future. Not what they've done over the last three years, because we, none of us have done enough. What they intend to do, how that is verified and measured and managed, and how that's quantified in a way that works for markets. Mike, you mentioned uh, uh, resilience also. Yeah, so internationality and resilience. And of course, it would be great to have a bit more detail of how you measure the, the, this, because it doesn't seem that obvious. But also, huh, whether you are me measuring um, the resilience or, or, or becoming greener? Huh? Because you might have obviously a lot of climate uh, risk is, uh, is nothing to do with the level of carbon emissions of the company itself. Absolutely. And, and for us, resilience and sustainability go hand in hand. So we don't look at sustainability purely through the lens of carbon. We measure it along five indices. So climate, diversity and inclusion, economic impact, social impact, and climate change and, and carbon. And within that, we what, what 
because there's so many interconnected pieces, there are so many unintended consequences. If you focus only on carbon, you can have a very negative effect on the environment. If you focus only on social, it can have quite a catastrophic economic impact and vice versa. You have to consider it in the round. And when you do, what we've looked at and measured is that organizations that consider this tend to be more resilient purely by the fact that they tend to have a longer term planning frame. Uh, longer term perspective. And that perspective means that from a risk management approach, they are looking at and quantifying the sustainability risk that they're facing over three to five years, which makes them better planners, which means that they end up being more resilient as organizations. What, what do you think about the Mike uh, initiative? So you ah. have a lot of experience on the reporting side, yes, and, and you're still developing reporting frameworks. Yeah. For climate risk, uh, uh, for climate risk, uh, you, Ben is also has a huge experience on that. How do you feel about uh, uh, the initiative that Mike is developing? Firstly, I must say congratulations on your maiden voyage, Martina, today. Um, and, I, and I think I mentioned just before we, we went on air that uh, I was um, I, I didn't look any different. But in 1995, I went to my first CSFI meeting, and uh, it's great to see the organisation still at the forefront of. Um, of thinking and, and, and flourishing and it's great to be on the line with, with, with Ben and Mike and, and Mike's raised uh, a theme that actually is, is at the heart of what I wanted to talk about because um, I've got two confessions to make Martina today there's mm -hmm. more but today is two I'm I'm an insurer not a banker mm -hmm. and I'm a geographer not an economist okay wow. those are my confessions okay but actually they're um uh they're, they're, they're turning a, a, a bit like uh a bit like Clapham to become uh, more fashionable by the day. So, um, I agree. essentially, the the sort of philosophy I, I've struggled with uh, ever since I went to, uh, and I'm a reinsurer by background. So, mm -hmm. but when I went to those first CSFI meetings in 1995, and climate was discussed, believe it or not, because the CSFI is so um, progressive, uh, my job was uh, uh, natural catastrophe reinsurance. So, basically, I was marrying actuarial science, uh, engineering metrics, and human and physical geography uh, to try and understand not what had happened in the past, but what could happen now. We didn't have to worry about a forward gear in those in those times. We did have to uh, worry about um, uh, a level of uh, events that had never happened before. Mm -hmm. And during the, um, it, you're, you're pretty old, aren't you, when you say uh, a quarter of a century ago in my career. So. Um, you know, in 1992, when I entered Lloyd's, the market collapsed globally yeah, uh, sure. after Hurricane Andrew, which was the last sort of punctuation mark on a, on, a, on a set of unprecedented losses from Mother Nature and U.S. lawyers and uh, tra tragically a, a naughty oil rig. And I've witnessed over this period of time that market go from ruin to relative resilience, despite a massive growth in risk. And really, it's been a philosophical and analytical transformation of how, uh, through the modelled world, um, we have made that market resilient, not what has happened, but what could happen now. And um, it's been a remarkable journey, but most people don't understand it. And what I, what I realised was how important the rather negative sounding theme of risk was to a much more positive uh, outcome of, of sustainability and resilience and it's been quite a long journey to see how at long last the worlds of sustainability which are about positive ends and the worlds of risk management are coming together yes. and realizing that actually um you, you you need them both you need the positive vision and ends of sustainability but you do need the nitty-gritty tools of, of risk risk that can then manage um not just capital but can uh, manage the implementation of legal duties of care, yep. as well as um, what wider policy. So, um, sort of, I'm not going to flick the ball to Ben in a second, but um, in essence, what we've sought to do um, is take some of those uh, lessons that have been learned in the in the rather um, rarefied and uh, an unknown world of reinsurance. And take some of that old wine and put it into a new bottle apply it yes to climate but to many other areas too and and put a forward gear on it and that's really what we're seeking to do 
with the Global Resilience Index is to, at long last, create a set of core methods and metrics that can do for resilience what uh, the units of tons of carbon have done for emissions and create a set of metrics that can then be deployed uh, at various spatial scales and in a whole wide range of um, uh, applications from, yes, managing capital requirements of banks to some of Mike's previous work uh, within the humanitarian sector. Because actually, the key thing is to have a, a common a common language and a common set of metrics. Once we do that, um, of course, people will need to blend those with many other uh, elements according to the particular uh, uh, domain that they work in. But um, And it's very exciting because actually through um, a lot of communities now beginning to realize that they are on the same page. And frankly, the, the, the convening half of um, Ben's team at Oxford um, at, the, um, at, the, at the Center for Greening Finance and Investment, and frankly, a, a network that he's created. I think we have got a fighting chance of, um, of delivering the first unifying output uh, for you know, everyone from the IMF to UNICEF, hopefully, in time for COP, COP27. So uh, exciting times that, frankly, we can't value resilience until we account for risk. And once we account for risk and make capital as well as legal duties sensitive to risk, then actually at a structural level, we can protect life, livelihood and shelter and basic rights, but actually find ways of sharing and managing that risk across populations and timescales um, sustainably. And I think we're at the cusp of that revolution. And I hope that the CSFI is uh, at the heart of that. And if, if it's not too rude, just one, one little thing I'd, I'd like, because I think it's fascinating what we said, said there. One, one of the things we talk about here a lot is we call it the green bean dilemma. And it goes to what you're saying about the quantification of risk and my uh, admission as well whilst i sound like a humanitarian my master's degree is in risk management so uh I, i'm probably a, fi a financier who ran away to the to, to join the, the the aid world um the, uh, uh, the what we call the green bean dilemma is across it's also the breadth of risk that you need to analyze and the fact that it can be quantified now we're actually at a point where we can understand that breadth. and the green bean dilemma we call because it's a simple way of explaining it if you are a restaurateur if you are running a, a large catering firm and you want your green beans to have maximum social impact you, you care about society and social impact there are some great cooperatives near Lake Naivasha in Kenya that get women and girls out of uh, they educate women and girls they get children out of the supply chain and they're reinventing economic models to be much more socially stable but those green beans will have a high carbon footprint because we're flying them in from Kenya if you want them to have a low carbon footprint, you can buy them from a wonderful organic farm in the Cotswolds, but the only social impact you'll have is sending their kid, second kid to private school, which, but you can't, you can't have both. And it's only by understanding all of these different points across economic, social, diversity and inclusion, climate and environment. You know, don't get me started on measuring biodiversity rather than carbon because we'll be here forever. But it's only when you understand these trade-offs that you as a financier or as a business can design your risk management plan to accommodate all the different touch points that you have across what should constitute sustainability. So I think it's fascinating. One thing, when we are looking at risk like that, yes, in terms of uh, um, ESG, there is one element and that risk is defined by government policy then. Yep. And government policy uh, changes, yes, because it's a different type of risk of uh, the the debate. Well, stranded assets too are defined to a certain extent by government policy, but less uh, comprehensively, maybe. How how do how do you tackle that? Because at the same time, we are speaking very often about very physical things, about carbon emission, about uh, you know, um, uh, geography. Physical events. Hmm? So, what is your methodology to consider well, the two? I'll kick off, and uh, uh, so I was fascinated also to hear that Mike's, uh, you know, so, so interested in, in transition risk because we've been we've been focusing with a team uh, that originally worked for the Climate Policy Initiative, um, uh, led by David Nelson and, and Tom Heller, who, who lucky for us jo joined us a year or so ago, and it is really to help. Um, measure the, the transition risk of both companies, but also sovereigns, um, uh, actually to do the same thing as I discussed before, make sure that capital is, is allocated to um, the right 
companies, but as mm -hmm. uh, Mike was highlighting, to actually allocate capital to where um, where there is there is potential to uh, to drive through the transition in a long time to engage. So so the exam question is uh, if if the world follows a, a Paris aligned pathway and uh, how, what would be the impacts on cash flows of, of your company as it currently stands? And it could be any mm. company and uh, yep. it could be obviously, it could be a natural resources company. I mean, an oil and gas or company and uh, they don't all have the same attributes because of course they have different costs, different, uh, they, they will, some of them will last longer in the, if you like, in the race than, than others. Yep. Um, and, uh, We've 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 been ha have the ability now to to, to assess about seven and a half thousand equities uh, across the world, which is uh, pretty much the, the global universe. And the nice thing is that with that, um, you don't have to be a green investor to decide to invest in that index and and retilt your allocations mm -hmm. to take account of transition risk. It's just good risk management. You should say, yep. of course. We, and this is looking ahead, sort of uh, over a period of sort of uh, fifteen to twenty years. And um, uh, it, it certainly seems to be, it, it's a published index. You can go there on, uh, on stocks and, and see it. You can even buy a fund now with the sort of the MSCI World Index, but, but tilted mm -hmm. a bit more differently. And I think it's this sort of work that's gonna help us find ways, yes, not just of, if you like, divesting, but also engaging with the organizations which have the potential to, um, to transition, but need support to get there. And um, that, that's very exciting. But again, it's it's the risk lens we're trying to use, but for a positive, um, you know, ultimately a, a positive outcome. But uh, uh, that's just one route up the mountain. I'm sure Ben and Mike, uh, and maybe even you, Martina, have others. My, Mike, one might want to speak because he was looking at interna intentionality. I, I would, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, I, I think, um, very much, to your question as well, and linking to this, for me, um, government policy is frequently set by public opinion, and you have to measure both at the same time. So we talk a lot here about real change, societal change will happen when two conditions are met, and that's when uh, society or consumers demand it, and when capital becomes conditional upon it. And those two things, I think, once you achieve that, drive government policy far more, especially when you're in more populist governments than, uh, than maybe previously. So it has to be a coming together not only of waiting for legislative requirement, it has to also be a big shift towards driving the incentives behind the allocation of capital and also how we influence um, public opinion on these things. And I think where we are at the moment those three things are coming together very nicely. The majority of the, you've seen all the stats, the majority of consumers nowadays, and those with the biggest spending power, want to see more sustainability impact, ESG, however you want to, to, to refer to it, in the products they buy. And harking back to my, my charity days, there's a really interesting dynamic going on. The younger generation give far less to charity than the older generation, far less. And they do that very much so because I think, and we measured this in, in a sociological study we did, I did previously, because they don't believe that the problems are today are of their making uh, and a lot of the things that, that, that uh, are related to that. But what they do do is they consume with uh, purpose. So they are far more likely to spend a bit more or target or prioritize brands and services that can demonstrate a solid underpinning of sustainability in ESG, but less likely to give to charity. So that public opinion is shifting and, and organizations that take that into consideration tend to be more profitable, tend to grow quicker. And the conditionality of capital, we're seeing a really interesting dynamic. As, as you know, the biggest pots on the planet, the Norwegians, BlackRock, all of the, the, the Calpers, Calsters, Ontario, all these really big funds are now making uh, ESG reporting a condition. It's not always good ESG reporting. We need to improve it. When we, I find when it tends to be developed by quant analysts, they tend to measure, uh, uh, they tend to ask what's easy to measure, not necessarily what's valuable to measure. And there needs to be quite a lot more work around the quantification of what's valuable. But because now that pressure is coming up and down, I think you'll find that legislation will change quicker and quicker because the pressures are, are, are coming from who pays the bills and who buys the product. Then tell us what is on your mind hearing all of that and right now with uh, the latest uh, uh, the latest events since uh, we last spoke. What is on my mind? Okay, well, let's move to the review bit of 
proceedings. Um, so there have been a number of developments, as you would expect, as always, since our last meeting on the 27th of January. Um, but Martina, just quickly to echo Rowan's point, congratulations on the appointment. Um, wonderful that you've joined and wonderful to be doing this with you. Um, so I've got a, just a few a few things that can be hooks for further, further conversation. Um, and I'm going to start kind of with an issue we, we left off with um, at the last meeting, actually, which was the, the, the long running debate about the EU taxonomy and mm -hmm. the fact that natural gas has been included, adopted together with nuclear in the proposals from the Commission. And this looks set to be approved um, uh, and, and uh, sent, uh, sent quite a unhelpful, I think, signal to um, market participants and to other stakeholders about the role of taxonomies. Um, and you've saw also, for example, Australia's LNG industry and other natural gas companies and other jurisdictions going, oh, fantastic. This is, this is, now, this is now green. So we're going to start trying to issue securities, raise capital, um, because we're now taxonomy compliant, which is presumably completely the wrong the wrong signal. Um, so be interested to hear people's views on that, but that was something that's um, still rumbling on. Right, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not actually completely au, au fait with the, the latest taxonomy development. So I, I'm gonna, I, I think, you know, that Ben's far more, far more up to speed with that than, than, than I am. So I will, uh, I, I will, I will graciously pass uh, okay. because I wouldn't dream of, uh, uh, of, of, of saying nonsense at a CSFI meeting. Oh, will that be the first time, me or the last? So I want to yeah, try and get you to say nonsense in this yeah. meeting. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think uh, it, it's, it, it's, I, uh, I think for, from a broader perspective and the way the EU taxonomy has been, been created, I think has some inherent problems. Um, um, one of the things I struggle with is it appears to be created, being created organically, like a lot of the EU legislation. So it, it's building blocks on top of each other as they come, as opposed to actually investing early on in understanding what an ideal scenario looks like and being honest about where they might need to make compromise. Because whilst LNG might be a requirement right now, I, I think if they were to come out and say it is a requirement for a period until we have a transition plan to this, because this is the ideal state, and again, moving forward to that measure, measurement of, of, of transition and intentionality, then uh, we all know the compromises need to be made within sustainability and, and ESG and, and how we actually green and, and, and progress towards COP27. But what really worries me there is it's just a black and white, okay, now we're accepting it. And what will happen, the consequences of that, I think Ben are exactly what you're saying. All of the more cynical, uh, either politicians or investors will go, great, natural gas is now green, fine, we can invest in it. And that will shift a lot of um, the ESG measurements probably in a negative way. They were advancing in a positive way, and I think you may see some of them uh, taking a step back. That's my greatest hope. Me, it reminds me of this whole debate and how much grief we uh, we gave in the, the UK gave to China on green coal. Um, and uh, the EU, I don't know if uh, some of you have been involved in uh, green bonds, Chinese green bonds and taxonomies, because uh, the, the Chinese were the first, I think, to develop uh, a taxonomy, and they included green calling it, yeah? which is uh, um, uh, enabling uh, bonds that dedicated uh, to um, uh, improving, uh, reducing the carbon emissions of, uh, of uh, uh, central uh, electric central um, central uh, thermic centrals uh, using coal hmm? to to reduce these emissions and uh, but still using coal and it's called green coal and uh, and there was this huge debate about and they're still going on about not being uh, not accepting internationally that definition and therefore uh, not accepting uh, the investments in Chinese green bonds at green. And then we come, uh, the EU does a taxonomy, and we end up in exactly the same problem because the problem still exists, and uh, and the problem is real of transition. And for me, I think sometimes the question is more: what do we use a taxonomy for? Uh, more than the, the, we cannot uh, politically, economically, probably uh, divest from uh, uh, gas or from uh, coal in China. Hmm? Um, we can maybe accelerate that uh, that uh, that process, but it cannot be from one day to the other. 
and therefore it's, uh, it's, there is an issue of uh, how we use the taxonomy. So then we have a taxonomy that is really green and, uh, and a different type of approach to accelerate um, uh, transitions in a more realistic way, because otherwise we end up, uh, I, mean, I think then it's quite clear, we end up with these inconsistencies, but that's, that's a personal opinion. But as, as Rome was sort of alluding to, you know, in, in good risk management presupposes that you understand the delta, the, the where you are now and where you want to get to. And where I think these taxonomies let us down is they don't define where we want to get to, they just tell us whether something is acceptable or not acceptable. And if we understood that even in a 15 or 20 year period that we need to phase out uh, gas, then at least all use of gas, which will need to continue for a while, can be seen as a transition issue. The minute that you say it's acceptable or not, then it no longer becomes a, a, a transition issue, it becomes an acceptable uh, green uh, product and therefore gets included in the funds that take no consideration uh, over the longer term about what they need to be transferring and transitioning towards. Your second issue, Ben. Well, so yes, conscious of time um, and conscious of wanting to cover off some of the big issues. So one of the big issues is around adaptation and resilience. It's always a big issue, but on the 28th of February, there was the latest IPCC report out on adaptation, um, which cast a, a pretty depressing outlook on uh, uh, well, climate impacts already locked into the system, even if we miraculously stopped emitting carbon tomorrow. Yeah. But Rowan, this is an area close to your, yeah. your heart and professional practice, so maybe you want to comment on that. Yes, no, um, uh, I haven't read all, all 1,300 pages, but uh, I have, I have, uh, I have given the, the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the policymakers review a, a, a good, a good serious skim, and some colleagues have been through it too. I'm pleased to say insurance is mentioned 567 times in the full document, so that's that's, yeah. that's progress. Um, but uh, I, you know, we, I, I mean, there's been plenty of coverage on it in in the newspapers and and, and on. And on online so everyone knows uh, who will have heard about the report that it uh, paints a, a picture that's um, uh, you know more bleak and uh, more immediate and, and more concerning than before and there's some great examples um, uh, around various types of hazard and, and, and geography um, I suppose the thing I really am concerned about because yes this this um, level of, of awareness and consciousness is, is obviously growing and a recognition that um, to focus on these issues does not have to be at the cost of uh, not focusing on, on mitigation. I mean, we've hopefully got over that uh, that uh, you know challenge of being able to focus on this issue openly. Um, but uh, the brutal truth is that um, we as economies, we as uh, companies, we as governments are still scared of taking the medical. We're still scared of properly assessing the level of um, uh, climate illness we're currently suffering from and how, uh, how bad that can get. We're still putting off properly going to the doctor and getting effectively the climate blood test because we are scared, A, of what it might actually mean to us and we're scared of, frankly, how painful the treatment may be and I see this all the time when there's con concern about whether it's um, obviously companies and others disclosing their their climate risk obviously the challenges are figuring out how to do it but obviously there's a nervousness about how that could be perceived there's a nervousness at the other end of the spectrum about properly um, presenting the, uh, the current as well as future risks of many small island developing states because of the fear of the fear of capital flight. But um, the brutal truth is that we do have to collectively take this medical and collectively see how we're going to treat those uh, who can treat themselves, particularly those who don't have the resources to treat themselves. And this gets into a broader question of, of risk sharing and risk management. Um, but um, I do hope that we do have uh, that medical uh, very soon. It looks like this COP27 is going to feature it pretty highly um, because uh, with the exception of some parts of the world, we still have the chance to turn this around. If we leave it much longer, we are frankly uh, in the realms of palliative care uh, at, at a global level. 
Um, and uh, so, so that's that's where I'm at. And I think we've just got to to face up to it. Of course, we all end up going to the doctor in the end. Unfortunately, sometimes we go to the doctor and uh, and it, and it's too late, and we're never going to get back to where we where we were. And uh, we mustn't leave it too too long for fear of um, you know a, a bad a bad medical. Mike, do you have? Um, a yeah, I, I think um, I, I, I agree fully. And I, I think sometimes, again, without sounding like a broken record, we, we what we're not very good at is um, highlighting the consequences of. So we talk a lot about more disasters and more problems like this. But when you actually break it down into all the associated issues that will come with the, with the report that's being released at the moment, one that we talk about a lot. Well, actually, I'll start with something else. I, I noticed at, at the, the UNGA around um, uh, the launch of the SDGs, noticed something really interesting. I was at an event where we were launching a very large uh, nutrition initiative. And every single time you stood up, unfortunately, and said that nutrition is essential, it, it, it's essential to a better education, economic development, and these type of things, you tended to get a very bored crowd. Um, sort of looking, yeah, yeah, kids are dying. That's not very good, but we, we've heard that a million times. Mm -hmm. When you could quantify that, it, and there's, there were numbers at that point showing that you could see up to a 13% bump in GDP within 10 years of achieving it, every finance uh, minister's radar went up and they started looking around. I think quant quantifying the cost and the associated risks that, that are linked to what the, I, the, the, the report has just come out is saying. So one, for example, is the level of migration that we're going to be seeing in Europe. It's the, the idea that Brexit is going to stop the stem of a few boats coming over the, the, um, uh, the, the channel when we know that the fastest growing population on the planet at the moment are in the areas most affected by climate change, like West Africa. When you have two, three, four hundred million people in an environment unable to support them just off the coast of Europe, where are they going to go? Because in my experience of, of 26 years of humanitarian aid, populations do not sit still when faced with an existential challenge. They move. When we're seeing 10 million people uh, at any given time in Bangladesh affected by climate change, where are they going to go when it gets worse? And I think the more we can see the associated risks linked to the climate change issues that we're talking about at the moment, the more likely they are for, to actually see that, you know, that value that, uh, that, that is inherent in addressing the issues as opposed to sort of the hand wringing that, that we're currently seeing at the moment. Yeah, and I, and I have to say those sorts of scenarios, Mike, that you were talking about, you know, to what extent are those factored into any financial decisions? Um, no. Of course, they're not at the moment, and that's that is that's you know something that we need to work on collectively. Um, now, just conscious of time, so another uh, go, going onto something back onto transition issues. So in February, um, late February, some interesting news from Australia with Brookfield Asset Management and Mike Cannon Brooks, who's a billion, an Australian billionaire, wanting to pursue a, a takeover of AGL Energy, which is one of the big power generators, power companies in Australia, um, has a lot of coal, coal assets. Um, and they were trying to uh, take it over to cook, close down the coal assets early and invest in renewables and transform the business. Um, this co caused a bit of controversy down under, um, particularly from the government, who wants the coal-fired power stations to keep going for as long as possible, because they think that's that, that's going to protect consumer energy bills. Um, I think they're wrong about that. Um, uh, so I think that Brookfield and and Cannon Brooks are now thinking about a hostile takeover. But I think we're going to see, um, hopefully, more of these sorts of approaches where. Um, different investors have raised capital and they see an opportunity to transition a company and transition it more, more quickly and more profitably than the current management thinks it can. Um, but this hasn't yet happened, but it's a, it's a very interesting example. I think it could be an absolutely fascinating. I'd, I'd love to see in a year or two the, the impact, the effect, and also the, the, the profitability, because it could be an absolutely brilliant case study that can then drive the conditionality coming with money. If the minute that money becomes cheaper, uh, the better the behavior or the, the more um, sustainable the ambition of the organization, the more likely I think we are to see people being braver, doing hostile takeovers and actually using uh, cheaper capital to, to, to manage some of that, that, that transition. I think that's a responsibility at the, at the two ends of the spectrum. Does capital location life? Absolutely. What else, Ben? Okay, so um, another bit of news from February. So uh, Bloomberg did a, a nice bit of analysis looking at 
big banks, particularly big US banks, and, and how they have managed to get significant ESG upgrades from MSCI, given that they had been financing um, more fossil fuels, certainly a lot of fossil fuels. So Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley all got upgrades on ESG, despite having provided $74 billion of financing to fossil fuel companies last year. The answer apparently lies in the fact that they're, they're, they're measuring the proportion of total lending. Um, so it's this, uh, the proportion of total lending associated with fossil fuels has gone down over that period, which has resulted in this, this ratings upgrade. But again, it, it highlights something we've talked about in previous sessions many times and we'll continue to talk about the value of these different ratings methodologies and how they should be used. I, I think that, that one really that I found fascinating. And the fact, I think also that MSCI had to come out and almost, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, admit that they didn't actually measure the sustainability or ESG of a company. They measured how much the effect of them talking about the sustainability, the effect it had on the markets. And I think this is one of the biggest issues we're facing at the moment is most of the, the bigger um, uh, sustainability ratings uh, aimed at uh, indexes and markets. First of all, they're all based on negative screening. So actually what they prove is that a company is not bad not that it's actually taking any positive step forward. It just proved, they just proved that the company's not doing anything uh, effectively wrong or evil. And I think you know, not being bad should not be how we define or, or sustainability or, or uh, the, the future. And they certainly don't measure um, the intentions and, and, and the plans that organizations have to transition in any meaningful way. And I think this is one of the biggest problems is unless you're managing uh, measuring that transition risk and that transition to uh, what we know is required under um, COP21 and COP26 and all the accords that have come out, then they're always going to be somewhat meaningless. And this is where I was saying at the beginning, anything that measures past behavior is vaguely useful, but things that measure a transition to a defined point and to your point, Ben, on, on the EU taxonomy and gas, all that does is drive the incentives for these higher level indices to have a much lighter touch and not necessarily measure the right things because all of a sudden it becomes something that's acceptable to do and therefore uh, organizations that are not necessarily behaving well can justify that through something that doesn't really address the longer term issues. Um, well, maybe I, I think maybe we, we should do an event on, uh, on indexes and ratings because um, it's uh, of course, I mean, it has evolved very, very rapidly huh? because, uh, because of the data that is being av made available now. Huh? So I think a few years ago, the only thing that was really being measured was uh, having a, a governance structure that took into account sustainability. So we have moved quite a lot uh, in the last few years. But uh, it will be interesting to, to, to see if, uh, if, if that continues uh, evolving rapidly and reflecting the, the availability of data and, uh, and the analytical capacity in the market now. Um, but also what is, the, what is the problem then in not having coherent series year after year? So because we, we might be also in the typical time series statistical problem, yeah? But, uh, maybe we, will, we might do something on that. Hmm? What else? Sure. So I think time for two quick things. So the first is um, uh, announced, I think yesterday, the um, the new commitment to negotiate a, a legally binding plastic pollution treaty. Um, so world leaders have given negotiators up to 2024 to, to do this. Um, if they do in that period of time, that'll be great if it's ambitious and uh, links back to domestic uh, legislation and enforcement um, but obviously we know that these things can take quite some time and even if it is legally binding the penalties as we saw with for example the Kyoto Protocol don't necessarily induce changes in behavior so although I'm very happy that this has happened and I think it will stimulate um, a lot of companies and a lot of investors to, th to think about their exposures and the opportunities for a different kind of transition for a more circular resource uh, less resource intensive um, economic models and so on um, just got to take it with a, a bit of a pinch of salt, I fear. Okay, and then um, the other, I think we'll just focus on this now in the last few minutes is, of course, um, Russia, Ukraine, and what that means for ESG and sustainable finance and um, 
you know, for, for, for what it's worth, I do think it's a, um, it's certainly expression of, of ESG. I think it will um, result in uh, Western companies and investors in particular thinking more about um, human rights abuses and their values and starting to map that onto companies and portfolios and jurisdictions more than they have been doing. Um, so I think it is quite a big deal for, for ESG and, and demand for ESG products and services. And then there are all sorts of energy issues as well that we could spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this is the common theme I think that's running throughout the, this discussion is because governments and markets so far have compromised so much on what they're prepared to buy because it's cheap, because it's easy, because it's, you know, there are all types of political um, uh, complications when it comes to Russia. Um, what they haven't actually done is come up with a plan for transitioning away over the last 15 years. We've known for a very long time that the, that the apparatus and the structure in the economy of Russia is not particularly healthy or, or, or on a good position from an ESG perspective. And yet we've ignored it to the point now that we're seeing a doubling or a tripling of fuel bills um, because we haven't tackled the issue uh, at source. And I think this is where, again, if we start actually having a very clear definition within a human rights framework, and this is why I was saying earlier, we measure social and economic alongside climate and environment and look for the unintended consequences. Unless we start looking at those social and economic indicators of sustainability alongside things like carbon, which is are equally important or plastic, et cetera, we won't tackle the big problem, which is how do we actually define what constitutes a good framework for measuring human rights and human rights abuses? And how do we define the objectives to transition away from them? Because I think that would be some of the biggest drivers. Long-term trickle sanctions, so to speak, will be some of the biggest drivers of economic change and will potentially have prevented what we see now. But I think um, uh, we're now on, on, on a situation, having seen, I was in the, the Chechen war and worked in Syria and Bosnia and Kosovo. And I think any, idea that this can now be negotiated out of or that sanctions will solve this problem is is pie in the sky um putin is in a situation now where he has to win or he is gone uh, and he will gone from his own people but he, the only thing that can change that is internal pressure at the moment i don't think any of the sanctions we have at the moment will solve anything but if we turned off the money 10 years ago or eight years ago then potentially he wouldn't be in a position to do this now Mm -hmm. Inside, inside. How, what are the implications for insurers of societal change? Can you insure against societal change? Because, I mean, th th there is a very interesting point with uh, the Russia and Ukraine, yeah, is that many companies are going further than the, uh, the legal obligation. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, you can really see how um, ESG indeed is much more at the, at the forefront of. Uh, of of people's minds and, uh, and, and of corporates. But uh, um, of course, the losses can be quite substantial. So uh, um, is there any kind of uh, potential uh, change in uh, insurance business models towards that? Um, well, there's, there's, there's two things to your question of, can you ensure societal change? If you're, if you're talking about, obviously, the, the impacts and, and, and risks of uh, the situation in um, in, in Ukraine. Uh, obviously, um, there are some uh, protections and insurances that, that that come in come into play. But I think more more fundamentally, Ukraine is making it very clear what we need to value as as societies mm. and economies, and the institutional substrate that many of us all take for granted but are absolutely uh, critical. Yes, not just to protecting uh, human rights, but vital though that is and fundamental though that is a uh, might, but actually protecting the value of capital in the, in the long term. So um, uh, so that's the, the first thing I'd say is, I think a lot of us are seeing in a way that never have we seen in our lifetimes in, in, in a region that perhaps uh, uh, for, for many, they assumed was, was broadly speaking stable, uh, the, the very uh, fundamentals of life and economy are at risk. And I think that is uh, waking a lot of us up to uh, what needs to be protected. So and my second observation is that actually insurance systems broadly defined, I don't just mean 
the insurance industry. I'm talking about uh, how we share risks between each, between each other through through welfare, through all sorts of mechanisms. You know, I'm you know, whether it was whether it was Britain in 1906 to 1908 with Lloyd George and Churchill, whether it was uh, FDR in the New Deal, or whether it was the post-war um, uh, post-war uh, creation of the welfare state and NHS in the UK, but actually was propagated in other countries too. This, we are, we are about to go through, and I'm not talking about Ukraine, I'm talking about the energy transition and many other things, the biggest social upheavals everywhere at the same time in an emergency setting in probably uh, an era of geopolitical and wider uncertainty. Historically, we've always waited to uh, the end of these processes to put the new uh, social contracts in, in place. Unfortunately, this situation is going to be so big and so um, uh, ubiquitous that we, we have to put these plans in place before the transition. So uh, I think uh, suspend disbelief, but the concept of insurance, which was so significant, it was at the focal point of the leading politicians of the time in the first half of the 20th century, but has now gone out of fashion, is about to be rediscovered, but at a far different scale with modern tools and technologies. But this time we have to get ahead of the risk because there are going to be regions and industries uh, that will be unable to cope unless we make it a just and manageable transition. The sort of uh, political and wider risks uh, that will emerge will make basically the transition uh, and economic well-being impossible. And so uh, what we owe each other, which I think is the title of a recent book by uh, the, the leader of LSE, uh, is, I think, very apposite. And I think the, the climate transition is going to be at the heart of that, uh, that debate. So go long on insurance, I think, is the key message from, from that. The role go go of, long on insurance. In society. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Great. I think that's a beautiful way of the finish for session. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you all soon. Thank you.